Hello everyone, my name is Gus. Hi, I'm Woody. Today we don't have a fun episode, and as a matter of fact, just starting. Viewer discretion, discretion advice, this uh, video is not for kids. Mm -hmm. So I know that a lot of you like to watch this with your kids. Please skip this one. Um, the subject that we're talking about is something that has been requested many times, which is the incident and death surrounding Audrey Mest, who was basically trying to set the record for no limit freediving. Um, and there is a whole documentary about this. It's 50 minutes long. We're not going to react to the whole thing. The link is below if you want to watch that without our commentary, of course. But uh, we are reacting to a subset of that documentary that shows the incident. And um, we want you guys to hear our reaction. I will say that by the time we start watching this video, you will start hearing some names like Pipin, for example. Pipin was Audrey's husband and the person that pushed her, basically, to get this record. Of course, Audrey, I'm sure, wanted to be the record holder too, but uh, this guy, um, well, you make your own opinion. I don't know what you want to add about that, but... It's hard for me to say anything because I'm just so pissed off at him and what happened and uh yeah i have nothing good to say like it's it's just really really frustrating to watch this so be careful go ahead yeah so anyway um pipin couldn't get you know himself to break these records that he was pushing his wife to do and before this attempt uh there's a diver a free diver named tanya streeter who you will see on the video she set the world record for no limit free diving for both men and women at the time, 160 meters. And she's actually still the holder of the record for women. It has never been beaten. So Audrey Mess was going to go and try to set the new record. Anyway, that's where the video starts. The moment he found out that Tiny Street had done the record, uh, he went ballistic. For Pepin, he had possession over Audrey and Audrey's records. So he felt that what Tanis Trader did more than against Audrey. It was against him. She looks like scared of him, doesn't she? If I'm honest, I think the reason that Pepin pushed Audrey was because Pepin couldn't do it himself. And I know that's really inflammatory and um, I hope he doesn't know where I live, but I truly believe that. Just six weeks after Tanya's dive, Team Pepin headed to the Dominican Republic for Audrey to begin training. The whole reason for us to be in Dominican Republic in October instead of December as we had planned before, it was Tanya Streeter. Tanya had made it to 160 meters. For Audrey to break the record, she would only have to dive 161 meters. Pepin want his wife, Audrey, to kick her ass really, really hard and trying to beat the man's record as Tanya did. She don't make decisions and that kind of stuff. He told her, do it, she do it. But two key missing members of the team were Nick Buckley and Guido Blas. Specifically, I asked her three times. I said, are you guys going to do anything this year? Oh, no, no, we're going to stay low. We have no sponsorship. Um, nothing's going to happen. And uh, uh, I made different plans. Also not on the team was deep water safety diver, Cedric Derolis who had died the previous year in a cave diving accident. Cedric had died, so they lost the 130 meter support diver. Mm. Now they had a big gap mm. in the water column. Kim McCoy provided Terrible. the computers that would validate the depth. Pepin just kept pushing her to go deeper and deeper and deeper every single time. When she was able to do a depth that would exceed any record ever done before by anyone, then I felt relief. I said, well, okay, we have enough now, more than enough, by a few meters, 170 meters. That was on Wednesday, October 9th. Wow. After the dive, 10 meters deep at the time. happy, she was quite depressed. I noticed there was a bruise in uh, one of uh, Audrey's eyes. It was a, a light bruise mm -hmm. right there. Where the bruise came from, I have no idea, but I noticed actually that she was not feeling good at all. Wow. The rumors were flying thick and fast. There was a rumor that Audrey had discovered she was pregnant. She probably wanted to get divorced with Pippin after the record. That was the rumor in DR. Hmm. There was a lot of loud and angry discussions with 
her husband Pippin. There was a lot of friction between him, Pippin, and Audrey. It was not really a good day before the dive day. That's so hard to watch, you know. It is. But... The day of the dive that morning was very stormy. So the countdown was stopped. Everybody was there for the record, so BP said, no, I'm going for it. It cleared up rather quickly. The countdown resumed, and a big crowd gathered on the beach where Audrey was to board a launch and be taken out to the dive site. Audrey was just very withdrawn. Obviously, something was just not right. Her mood was bizarre. She was cut off as if in a soundproof, clear booth that moved with her. She stood at the edge of the water and stared into the ocean. Mm, strange. You know, I'm not the best to talk about this stuff because I've never been a victim of abuse of any kind verbally or physically. Um, but I wonder if people watching this show that have been victims of domestic abuse and, and all of that, if they can identify some of the signs. Because I'm a complete idiot, like I said, when it comes to this stuff. Because I've never been part of it. I've never abused people and I've never been abused myself. And I can see signs. And I'm an idiot. So it's just hard to watch. Yeah, and what I really am, I, I'm sitting here wondering, why did she feel this way? In other words, was she saying to him, I do not want to do this? And he is just if abusing her into doing it because look at her and, and, and the, the black and blue mark on her eye and all of that. What? What happened? And we'll never know. But, I mean, who wouldn't be thinking what I'm thinking right now? Something was not right. Pippin was very nervous. He was like all over the place. Does that look like that somebody that's pumped up about it? It was it was doing... troubling. There there was a lot going on that wasn't it didn't feel quite right. <laughs> yet it just like Greek tragedy ground on toward this end that everyone could see coming. I mean, it feels like she's trying to avoid him. Yeah. It was actually two times when people asked if the bottle was filled with air, and I could hear Pippin reply, "Get away from it." and take care of other things. Just leave it alone. I already take care of the bottle. It's filled. Leave it. So I, I feel like okay, fine. I feel like you should play that absolutely over and over again. Everybody pay attention to that last line. He said, get away. Regarding the bottle they're talking about is the bottle that she has to use to turn on to inflate the sled that's going to bring her back to the surface. I just want people to understand. Yeah, and it's important the, to what, talk about no limits. Yeah, exactly. Otherwise, you won't know what bottle. What are we talking yes. about? So no limits free diving is a discipline where you can have aid descending and ascending. So you're basically not having to <laughs> swim all the way as deep as you can go and swim your way back up. So they attach themselves to a weighted slate. And hang on until they get to whatever depth. Then they open a bottle that inflates a balloon, basically. And that balloon takes them to the surface. So it's super fast down, super fast up. And that's why they can go to super yeah. ludicrous depths. There's three basic steps that you know we didn't know, but we've been explained. Grab the top of the sled because you're getting ready to go for a ride. Yeah. Turn the gas on and pull the pin that basically releases the weight and you start flying up. Yep. But if there's no gas, I'm just saying that's, so that's the tank going to go that you're nowhere. talking about. The tank that inflates the balloon, he's like, don't touch it. I took care of it. Don't even check it. See if it has air. Don't even look at it. But if you don't have that, you cannot go fly up, up which is like deadly. Okay. Just kind of put the equipment there and left it and really went back to my own business of doing what I needed to do as a surface diver. 
I just couldn't see the future. I just couldn't see it. For me, it was just an event. But this event, due to lack of safety protocols, would have never been sanctioned by Ida. Although Audrey had plenty of safety divers on the surface, the deep water safety divers were another story. Mm. Compared to Tanya's 16, Audrey had two. Oh my god. I mean, do you think Tanya would have done the dive without any of those safety divers, let alone 16, I mean, let alone two? With 15, would she have done the dive? With 14, would. So just, just let's keep going. Well, That's but just, just to illustrate, just to illustrate the, the insanity of that. She's going down to 170 feet, right? Meters, meters. 170 meters. That's true. Which is over 500 feet. Okay. And during that space, whether you look at it in meters or feet, I don't care. To have only two divers watching the whole space. And nobody at the 130 meter level, I mean, so there would be a long time, a long gap as you're going up where you're totally alone. I mean, it's just, it's just, it's really crazy. I keep watching this and I'm just. Let's go. I mean, you don't want to use the word murder, but. Ya se condado redactivo, yo bajo a 80 metros, que era mi, fue mi posición, con aire comprimido, había solamente para Pascal Bernabé, que iba a estar en 172 metros. So this guy went to 80 meters on air. He was a safety diver at 80 meters, which is 250 feet or something like that, on air. Knocked out of his mind. Even with Pascal at 172 meters and Wiki at 80 meters, that left a gaping hole at the 130 meter mark. And, and by the, the way, not, 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 not just that he's narc, Gus, the important point is that safety diver that is at 80. Well, we, one was even deeper. 170 meters. Okay, this guy. That guy cannot go up quickly. And he certainly can't go past a certain point without massive deco. I mean, all of us divers understand that, right? Yes. So just think about that. He can only go so far if he has to rescue her or he will die if he takes her the rest of the way up because there is nobody to hand her off to. That's why we're talking about this gap. Right. It was a gap that really was just underfunded. Cedric had passed away. And the cost of a mixed gas diver with experience was not zero. But Pepin, determining the rules with his own organization, the IAFD, proceeded despite the obvious dangers. Like usual, four or five minutes before she starts diving, I was descending uh, fast, you know, on the, on the cable. At T minus three minutes, Wiki began his descent to the 80 meter mark. Audrey used the remaining time to pack enough air for the three and a half minute dive. A kiss from Pepin and Audrey took her final breath. Mm. I was keeping pretty careful track of the time as I always do. I suppose I was 20 meters from the dive boat in a little skiff. I'm holding the line and Pepin was doing the same also from the water because we get to feel the vibration coming from the sled just going under and brushing against the cable. So we have a way to determine more or less what's going on. When I look at Pepin, it was as if something was just not right. But on the other hand, nothing was wrong. Look how fast she's dropping talk about the need to clear quickly each meter that's three feet a second well she hit 40 meters which is recreational maximum depth in less than 25 seconds flying i had the feeling something was not right before she hit the bottom it takes decades of experience but if you look at a line you can see how it's oscillating in the water column this can be caused by current but it also be caused by the tension on the line and the fluctuating tension on the line. And it just didn't look quite right. Oh, man. 
A minute and a half into the dive, to tell Audrey she was nearing the 170 meter mark, Pascal clanged his pipes. I saw Audrey arriving like usual, you know, fast. At one minute and 42 seconds, Audrey's sled reached the bottom of the line. And then uh, the first bad surprise, when she finished to open this tank, which was uh, supposed to, to fill the lift bag, uh, nothing happened. So I took one of my uh, regulators and uh, I inflate with my uh, own gas. Then she starts to, to ascend. But, but Audrey's rate of ascent was far too slow. Exactly. Had there been a safety diver at 130 meters, they would have seen that Audrey was still struggling. But the next closest diver was Wiki, 90 meters above. I'm in. A 300 foot gap. They passed 30, 40, 50, one minute, and she didn't come. She didn't come. He can't inflate that Pascal lift pack. Vanity, who was at 170 faster meters enough. on a trimix, he could not rise very fast. He mm -hmm. did rise faster than he should have because he realized too that something had gone awry. He last saw Audrey at about 165 meters, 162 meters. Mm. Three we minutes. Counted. The time lasted three minutes. She's supposed to be back between three to three fifteen, three twenty minutes. And then you don't see the sled moving. When she's coming back, you see the cable is moving fast, but she's flying back out. And then, you know, you don't see the divers doing anything at the top. Mm. I thought, well, okay, it's taking a little bit longer than planned. That's not so bad. It's only three and a half minutes. No big deal. No distress, no signs of distress on the dive boat. To his snorkel, he was just screaming, fuck! PP was screaming up to the surface boat that he wanted his scuba gear. And they threw down the scuba gear to PP, and he, it took him one minute to put it on. She's still so deep. She's so, so deep. The meters. blue, I saw that she, she left the, the cable. Pascal found her at 124, drifting like a leaf in autumn through the water column. She passed out. She was in blackout. So I ascend very fast, very, really very fast, probably my fastest ascent. When I see that the leg comes lentamente, solo, I That's from the little bit of air he put the in. The moment when people at surface knew something was terribly awry was when the lift bag came to the surface and there was no Audrey. And of course at that point, my heart probably was beating probably three times faster than normal because I knew that something had happened to her already at that point. It's like insane. You know, what would you be really having? Like, what can you say? It truly is astounding to me that so little was put in place for her safety. And I mean no disrespect to the divers that were in, in the water to her, because I, I believe that, I don't believe that somebody can dive and, and do safety for somebody else with intent not to help them. What I don't understand is that whoever is in charge of the logistics on a dive like this, and for me that's my husband, why that person doesn't put every single system in place for safety, it doesn't make any sense to me. Or to anyone. Pascal had ascended with Audrey unconscious to 90 meters, where he had to stop. To ascend any farther without decompression would be risking his own life. So at 90 meters, Pascal had no other choice other than stay there and wait to see if someone would help him. And there was no one. Until Pepin descended with a tank, took an immense risk of his own to save his wife. Pepin was able to quickly eat his spinach and, and 
race down, dive bomb down to whatever, 90 meters or something. That, yeah, it, it, madness. Oh, Crazy air. dive. Crazy dive. A, a buscarla. Siento que una, siento que una persona me vira la cabeza, me tumba la cabeza hacia un lado y me pasa por encima. Cuando reacciona que veo, Pipín. Pipín bajó de allá arriba, de superficie, a rescatarla a ella. Con un tanque. Pipín. And then at this moment, uh, Pipín arrive and uh, catch her and Asa. Donde él viene, le quita a Audrey a Pascal, se la pone de espalda a él, ella de espalda a él, se vio en superficie. He risked his life not only in taking the dive to 90 meters on air, but also in the rate of ascent. He been going so fast on the way up that he's actually, his head is above the bubbles. The bubbles are just being left behind. And that goes completely against rule number one in school diving, that you are not to ascend any faster than you smaller bubble. Pascal, ahí tuvimos, tuve dos horas. Eight and a half minutes. Several hours he had of Deco, Pascal. Lo he visto en video. Es monstruoso lo que sucedió en la superficie. When Pepin finally surfaced with Audrey, eight minutes and 38 seconds had passed. When they popped up out of the water, <laughs> I was taken aback. She was supine in the water. A lot of pink foam was coming out of her, her mouth. Over another minute passed as Pepin frantically tried to resuscitate Audrey in the water. Horrible technique, by the way. This guy doesn't know what be going in slow motion and I remember thinking good heavens why why are they moving so slowly it's hard to watch this doing a wall break supposed to be qualified people there Look once you get out of the water it's supposed to be a real doctor there mm -hmm. when Audrey was finally lifted into the boat the doctor turned out not to be a medical doctor. I was in the water when they were screaming after the doctor, and he was like, I'm not a doctor, I'm a dentist. She certainly did have a pulse. I saw it with my own eyes. She needed at least a recompression chamber or a medical doctor skilled in hyperbaric medicine. There were none. After eight minutes, 38 seconds, you don't need a doctor, you need a miracle. They got her into the launch and headed for shore, and I could see Matt trying to do CPR. At that time, she still had a pulse, and we kept rolling her on her side because uh, the foam was still coming out of her mouth and nose, just pouring out, so it was really had a difficult time getting any kind of air in her. Now, if she still had a pulse, when they said they're doing CPR, I mean, basically, you just want to give rescue breaths with a high content of oxygen. I mean, you wouldn't give chest compressions if she still has a pulse. That's right. I'm just saying, I don't know what they're doing there, but... Well, I mean, you saw the breath. Look, look, look at this where I froze it. What does that look like to you? I'm just... Okay. And when we got to see, shore, like, I expected see to that? see a, uh, you know, a backboard or something on the beach or a, a Stokes litter or something like that. But no, they had nothing like that. I couldn't believe that we were on the beach and they were fumbling around trying to get a beach chair to take her. Where's the room. oxygen? Oh, there it is. Okay, they have one, but I don't know why it's in her hand. They're not using it. Yeah, they don't. Probably don't know how to do it. So what? Holding it like Put what? the oh, oxygen on her, man. I think it even has a manual trigger yeah, it was valve. pretty chaotic as far as getting her from that boat to the infirmary. Disaster. And it was a long trek because it was up the beach through the... I remember we went through some walkways. I didn't even know where it was. When we got there, they were painting in the infirmary. The whole thing was crazy. Everything was wrong from the beginning to the end. I mean, it's like the girl don't have a little break to survive that day. 
It took more than 30 minutes to get Audrey to the nearest hospital, where shortly after arrival, she was pronounced dead. Man. What, what, what more could they have done to kill her? I mean, seriously, what else, what else, what else could you say? I mean, there, every proto safety protocol was blown off. It did, sure doesn't look like CPR was done properly since she had a pulse. The time it took, no safety diver in the water. The time it took to get her out of the water, no doctor on the boat, a dentist. No, no oxygen either. Well, there like. looked like there was oxygen on the dinghy, but I, the girl was holding it. Why I don't, I mean, listen, this is obviously why this thing is still being talked about, right? I mean, we're not the first ones to react to this, but. You know, and as I mentioned, there's way more to this. Um, the full documentary is down in the description. I encourage you to, you know, go watch that. But I think that even though, like I said, we are very, we have very little knowledge when it comes to free diving. We can see, you don't even have to be a diver. You can see how much lack of safety was present. It's mind blowing. I mean, in 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 our just right here conversation, would you agree that if it's not the single most important item, it's definitely in their top three from what we've learned, the damn tank having air in it that's going to bring you back to the surface. Is that and is that maybe the single most important piece of equipment for this sport? Absolutely. I mean, I, I don't know. What else is more important than the thing that's going to bring you up? I, seriously, right? Yeah. So just think about that. That singular, single most important equipment. And you saw the video where he's like, get away, get away. I got that. I got that. The single most important don't thing check it. is sort of being kind of brushed off. Uh, there's nothing more important. Well, I mean, we could boil it, analyze it. But if that had air in it, would she be dead? I'm, I'm, these are questions. If that had air in it, she turns it on, she held up, pulls the pin, would she be dead right now? So I'll That's a really, really good question. And I think that we're not, even though I feel like we can, we can answer that question, most people would agree with our answer. I think that there's even someone better to answer this question. So what we did is... You know, one person that you saw on the documentary a couple times, the person who set the record that Audrey was trying to break, Tanya Streeter, she actually lives in Texas. And we reached out to her because we wanted to talk to her about this. And we thought that you would also enjoy the conversation with her. And we just want to bring her on the show and ask her these questions. If anyone can answer, if that one piece of equipment functioning correctly meant that Audrey would still be alive, or at least she would have survived this incident. If anyone can answer that, it would be Tanya. So let's bring her on the show. So... Welcome, Tanya Streeter, to the show. We uh, wanted to ask you a few questions because we just reacted to the video about the incident surrounding the death of Audrey Mest. And we're not experts on free diving. We're not experts on everything we're watching. So we felt like we should bring you. World-classness. To... <laughs> world... <laughs> That's right, world-classness, uh, to answer some questions. Is that a word? Yeah. Um, it's but... now. It is now. Before we get started, can you talk a little bit about yourself and, you know, kind of what you used to do because you're no longer free diving, but what you, at least competitively, but what you used to do and where are you now and your projects and all of that? Yeah. So um, I started free diving uh, probably all, all but from birth, but not with the knowledge that that was uh, what, what I was doing. Um, consciously free diving, knowing that it was actually a sport in late 97 and uh, went on to start competing and breaking records in, I think, uh, my 
first record was the American Constant Weight, and I want to say that was January 98. Mm. And then my first No Limits, which was my first world record, uh, was then in May 98. And then I just went on and on and on and on and on. And then in 2002, found myself challenging the World No Limits record for both men and women. Uh, my background, born and raised in the Cayman Islands, didn't have anything to do but be in the ocean. So that's my, my passion, my comfort zone. Um, and so freediving, you know, just, just turned into something, something cool that I was decent at, at a time in my life that I enjoyed the self-discovery of it, that journey that you go on. Um, and that was what my obsession was. It was not the records or the competition or anything like that, but it's where you find yourself when you turn out to be pretty good at, at that stuff. Um, and then now, yes, I, I had that long freediving career or I mean, it really was only about a decade actually. Um, and then transitioned around about 2004, began transitioning into film, uh, presenting uh, wildlife and freediving documentaries with the BBC and um, other you know, films sort of about free diving, focusing on my world records and things like that. Um, and it all kind of fell into place for me when I got involved with uh, what was then the Plastic Oceans Foundation, now Ocean Generation. And we uh, worked on a film called A Plastic Ocean, which is still on Netflix, doing great things. Um, and it sort of answered the question that I always had for me, which was like, why do I have this talent? Like, what's it good for? Holding your breath is not, you know, everybody says, oh, it's so great. <laughs> and, you know, you, you, you must be superhuman and all of these things. And my standard response was like, I didn't find a cure for cancer or anything. I just <laughs> have fun doing this and that's that. So, but I, I really did wrestle with that. I, I wrestled with it before the No Limits world record, which then only added to things for me to wrestle with. Um, and, um, you know, that at least helped with that. It, it gave me an answer. Up until then, I had involved myself with different NGOs and environmental charities and organizations, um, but it was all a bit surface level. You know, I didn't like taking a picture and signing something and that being, I wanted to get my hands dirty, I wanted to learn, I wanted to grow. Um, and the film really offered that for me, obviously, as a, as a presenter, as an on-camera presenter, I grew um and then I, my, my knowledge of the issue of plastic pollution just grew exponentially with every shoot i'd come back and change something in this house about the way that we cook or eat or you know uh awesome. dispose of things and shop everything so it was hugely impactful and really made me feel like all that work um i think being a professional athlete is quite inherently selfish and then when it's something like free diving and extreme sport that people don't understand or you know basically terrifying for people that love you to watch you go do um you know it, it felt like it, it made it worth it um putting everybody through that and, and myself through all of it i want to get more into the actual dive that you did where you set the record and that will tie into lots of questions i have about audrey's dive so when you entered the water, you, you had a complete safety team in place, right? What in your mind did you require as the athlete to do that dive in terms of the safety protocols that had to be in place for you before, for, forget even talking about the dive yet, before you got in the water, you had a conversation with somebody and said this is what has to happen can you describe that um yeah i mean the ada rules are very clear and i follow the rules i mean it's it's basically as simple as that if i if you want me to break it down uh Bri briefly to, briefly not like the whole yeah i mean and also standards. rules have changed i mean the big thing about all this now is that no limits is no longer sanctioned by ada so CMAS sanctions it, and if you want to whip up your own freediving organization and sanction it, it turns out you can do that too. So, um, but ADA, which is the organization that I value and respect and have been involved in, um, who I believe have the strictest, safest rules and certainly did at that time, um, those are the rules that we followed. They required divers within a certain distance of each other um, and in pairs and you know, we were kind of writing the rules as we went then, just purely because people weren't diving that deep and were pushing the limits of mixed gas diving at those depths. Um, my deepest diver 
I believe his plan was to not descend below 500 feet. And I mean, he did, as you can see in the film, very briefly in case he had to assist me. Um, but, you know, we were safety, 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 safety. And we were absolutely also autonomy. Like anybody on the team could call a dive for any reason. And I called dives because I get in the water and be like, what the hell is everybody so mad about? Why aren't you guys talking? What's going on? What's good? We're not diving. If we're not having fun. Everybody out. We're out. I don't want to do this. Wow. No, not worth it. Um, we awesome. have situations where we jump in the water and for me, I look down the rope one day and I see this like, you know, three meter, uh, four meter oceanic white tip shark banging up against rope. And I'm like, anybody else want to quit? Nobody else wants to go. I'm like, damn, you know, <laughs> and I'm the only one that's dressed like a giant bait fish without all the bubbles going off. So, you know, we, we had a lot of that captain who, you know, you'd think the boat captain, he's the most important person on the boat. And in this situation, he sort of isn't, he's, you know, he's the captain. He's the reason we're out there. He keeps us safe. But once the diving starts, he sits down. And there was a day where we were diving in rough weather and the, the whole rig that was attached to the side of the boat was starting to crack the fiberglass. And he called in. He was like, you know what? Nope, this isn't safe. This thing breaks off. Everybody's gone. You're not getting up back. She's attached to everything. That's it. So, you know, we, we took the ADA rules and then we made them safer. Uh, because of the, the, the respect and the philosophy that we had as a team. Um, so that's all really that went into, you know, how did you decide what we put in place? And the other part is training. Uh, it's not just training for me. It's training for all of the divers. You don't just mm. put, a, put a group of unknown people together and say, all right, everybody's going to their deepest they've ever done today, and we're going to do a world record. There were six weeks of diving every other day, everybody gradually getting deeper and deeper, everybody getting habituated with all of the conditions gear, ocean conditions, uh, you know, free di diving with free divers. Had, are they great divers? Yes. Have they ever done support for free divers? No. So, you know, we don't dick around with that at 500 feet. You know, we do that at like 200 feet and that's where we start. So um, you, that, that basically in a nutshell was the, the philosophy as we, as we approach that gently, slowly, respectfully, safely. Now, when you started that record dive on the documentary, I, you had a moment right at the beginning, right, where you were gulping the air. Packing, yeah. Packing the air. And then can you explain, number one, what, what you're doing, the gulping, the, the packing of the air? What are you doing exactly when you're doing that? Like, what is it? And then what happened to cause you to kind of be out of it for a second? And then what happened to say, I'm fine, let's continue? Right. So it's yeah, pretty much as you see in the film, um, or as you hear me discuss in the film, you, you take a deep breath and you have muscles to do that. You have your intercostal muscles, your rib muscles, you have your abdominal muscles, your muscles in your back, your muscles in your chest, your muscles all in your thoracic area and stomach that will help you expand your rib cage, expand everything to allow your lungs to reach capacity right my muscles right now in the stomach area no, <laughs> some more than others <laughs> um and so you know once you've used all of those then free divers have developed a technique called packing where you basically suction more air volume and you're not swallowing it and putting it in your stomach it looks a bit like that but it isn't it's going down your trachea into your lungs and it's just a way of, sort of topping off your lungs um once you've used all your muscular strength to do that. And I think at the time I could add just over a liter of lung capacity wow. just by doing that. So it's worth it. You know, you think about the depths you've got to go to and you've got to be able to hear your ears and all the rest of it. Um, the problem with that is that it creates a degree of intrathoracic pressure. So you think about your lungs have now right, really taken up all the space in your, in, in your, your chest cavity and your heart's in there and it wants to beat boom, boom boom, 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 and you're squeezing it and it can go boom, 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 boom. And it's just not very efficient. And if you do it too much, it will inhibit, it will prohibit oxygen from being sent to the brain because it's not pumping efficiently. This is this is all very clearly, I'm not not a doctor, um, a, a very right. lay explanation of it. Right. But um, so so then you don't get oxygenated blood to the brain and there's a very transient loss of consciousness, very quick blackout, faint. The immediate thing that happens then is you exhale, you therefore release the pressure that's on your heart, it resumes beating properly, boom boom, blood to the brain, you wake up. So on the film, and yes, in real life, right before the record, this is what I did. 
I slumped forward very briefly. I think I knocked my nose clip off on the sled. I came around. I realized what had happened. I told my husband that I overpacked. I looked at the judge and said, can I go? And again, as we all acknowledge under the rules then, there were no rules that said you couldn't go. So um, so I took a, a quick deep breath. I packed a couple times and, and left the surface. And um, yeah, so I, I, I did, I left in a stressed, not adequately prepared state uh, because the angel was saying, just try, <laughs> you know, just give it a shot. Everybody else is in the water doing their best today. Why shouldn't you at least give it a shot? Um, and so that was, you know, that was it. And then I think all that mental training kicked in. Um, you know, my faith in my team, you got to understand those people, whilst I'm horrified to admit that today, I can't even remember everybody's names. Um, I think the memory of them will go with me to the grave whenever that is going to happen because it's huge. I couldn't do it without them. I couldn't go on that self-exploration without those individuals. Um, and that was huge to me, regardless of the, you know, the world record at the end of it. So, um, you know, putting myself into that situation in that condition, not ideal, but it is because of them. Um, that I was at least able to get over myself and say, okay, not an ideal start. Don't know what that means, but I'm not going to decide right here and now that it means I can't do it. I'm going to keep going. I'm going to trust my body. I know I'm safe and I'm going to push possibly a little too hard. When okay. you were going down after that point, you're flying down. You're all, did you feel good the whole way down? Like, do no. you know in your mind, are you like, oh man, it's, it's pain early that I don't normally have or something like that. And you just mentally overcame it. I love it how fast that? she answered. No. <laughs> <laughs> no. I mean, tell me about um, that because we're going to get in. You've said some things that are going to tie directly into Audrey's dive. And I just yeah. got to well, finish this line of questioning. Yeah. Obviously not the first time I've been asked all these questions. <laughs> so I know where we're headed with this. Um, I'll do my best to, you know, not deviate. So uh, yeah, immediately I left the surface and the angel is in my ear like, yeah, keep trying. And the devil's like, really? Seriously? You've been, you know, having the snot kicked out of you at the surface with the waves. You just blacked out. You don't know. Nobody's ever been to this step. Well, I had in training a week before, but um you know this this is not a known place this is too many unknowns whatever and yeah i mean for the first normally um quite honestly 100 meters or so 330 feet uh, equalization is not difficult um upright um trained i have uh, you know a decent lung capacity um and instead of it starting to be difficult around 100 meters, it started to be difficult around 80 meters. And I know this because of where divers are stationed and all the rest of it. And again, you become in tune to how it feels, the light, everything. Um, and when I got to 100 meters, I, I thought I was done because it was just could not equalize. And I'd had trouble equalizing during training. Certain times I'd had a sinus infection and stuff. But, you know, I was ready. I was good. Physically, I was I was exhausted but I was in good shape um and and that was the point at which you know my mental training kicked in and I was just like well just try you know every meter now you just try you know, everybody else trying their best just try everybody else is here just try you know you you know as a free diver for almost every dive you ever do you're going to surface and everybody's going to go well done I don't care that you didn't go where you said you're going to do you went so much further than me well done um and so you know that that you can keep that in your back pocket if you want or for me you compete against yourself and the constant conversation is um come on, just try. You, this, the, you're, you're the queen of just try. You, you, you gotta <laughs> walk the walk now. So that was it. I got to a hundred meters and yeah, I mean, it was brutal. I couldn't clear. I was frustrated. I stopped the sled. I think it was about 110 actually. And um, there was a couple divers there uh, and I could hear them and, uh, you know, mixed gas, they sound like Mickey Mouse. And so like, go down here, go down here, go down here. And I'm like, oh God, you know, I'm trying to equalize, trying to equalize. And I think I, I cleared one side, kind of squeezed another side a little and thought, okay, well, we're just going to go for it. So I took the brake off the sled and I, and I almost literally inched, uh, you know, from 110 to 160 and it was slow going and it was more than likely the single biggest contributing factor to then 
have, being so narked uh, at the bottom, um, you know, my exposure at that point to narcosis, you know, there I was screwing around at 110 meters and then I'm like, you know, Blowing slowly kisses. going down to 150. Um, and at that point, the pain is obviously in my eardrums. Um, you, you, you feel the pressure on your chest, but it's not like pain. It's, it's significant. Like I've always said, it's an elephant sitting on your chest, sticking hot pokers into your ears, little bastard. And uh, it hurts. It doesn't feel good. And so, you know, then I got to the, to the bottom and I, am I racing ahead? Do you want me to stop? No, go. no you're good. Keep I was going. actually going to ask you if you were doing Valsalva the whole time. So how are you clear? Okay, sidebar, I have no clue. So I don't know. I hold my nose and I blow. Uh, I, whenever I had problems teaching other people that couldn't equalize, I would be like, say five times, hold your nose and blow, hold your nose and blow. And then, okay, you got to go talk to my husband because I, I don't <laughs> ever remember learning how to equalize. That's awesome. uh, he would have, as an adult, worked through the mechanics of it and figured it out for himself. And he, in 99% of the time, you know, I'd send somebody to the other rope on the other side of the boat and they'd work them through and then they're good. And I, I just, so maybe, I don't know, I guess if it's the one that you hold your nose and blow, yeah, that's the yeah, one fine. I would do. Yeah. yeah. And you've started to feel, not, when did you, when did you, when did you start to feel narc? Take us to the bottom. What happened? Take us back up. And then um, let's jump into so, Audrey. So I arrived at the bottom. Um, I felt fine. I think I, if I recall correctly, I, I basically felt fine. I didn't feel any effects of narcosis at the bottom. Um, I, I mean, I, per perhaps I was because I, I, I either was stressed. Um, I mean, I know I was narcs, but at the bottom, I'm not, I'm not convinced that's when it kicked in. Um, I know I was stressed. I had my three things. You put your hand on the lift bag. Step one, open you open up the valve on the pony tank that's dumping air into the lift bag. Step two, and then you pull the pin, which releases the weighted portion of the sled from the lift bag. And you put two hands on that lift bag and up you go. And I had a, a harness that attached from, uh, it was an old climbing harness actually, that I was wearing that was then attached to a rope that was on a, a lanyard above the lift bag of the sled. So had I let go, it, it would still all have pulled me to the top. That was one of our safety things that was in place. I mean, it was the first time that lanyards had been used in any way, shape or form in free diving. And it was to me, it was, to me and Paul, my husband is kind of a no brainer. So, uh, so, 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 you know, one, two, pull the pin three. Now under the, maybe the early part of narcosis or me, I got to the bottom and I was like, good Lord, I'm finally here. I always knew I wanted to take a moment to look around me. I already knew at that point that I wasn't going to do that again. Um, you have to understand my relationship with the sea. I mean, I'm not going to discount anybody else's relationship with the sea, but it's very strong for me. It is, it is all the things to me in my life that I've ever needed at exactly the right time. And right here, right now, it was affording me the opportunity um, to explore myself in a way that, you know, nobody else sees. You're the only one down there. You're, you're so, so incredibly alone within yourself that it's, it's really powerful. And it was something that I sought. It was what I needed. Um, and so I knew I wanted to, to take a moment. I had a conversation with the sea every time I'd go out on a training dive, you know, that, it gets a bit altruistic. This is the part I'll try to get through without crying. I'd be like, okay, I'll, I'll pay you back. You know, just, just let me do this dive. Let me not keep me safe or don't make me die. Like it wasn't like that. It was just, I wanted to be able to have everything lined up so that I, the only thing that I had to fight was myself. And it is a fight with yourself. Um, who wants to do that? It's a fight with yourself. It's, it's hard to realize um, sometimes when you're not good enough to do the things, the, 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 the target goals, whatever you've set yourself, is that sometimes it's really hard to realize that you can, if that makes sense. Sometimes success is actually harder to swallow. And when you, when you, when you're the first to witness that success and you have that success so completely alone, it's a lot, it's a lot. And so, you know, my relationship with the sea was such that I wasn't alone. I was sharing it with her and, mm -hmm. um, and it was huge. So that's where my kiss to the sea comes from. Um, and I had always known that I wanted to get to the bottom of the rope. It's pitch black. I wanted to be able to just close my eyes and look inward, open my eyes and look outward. 
and say thank you to the sea and then go on back up again. So probably at that point, the narcosis was settling in because I, I, I confused my, you know, my one, my two, my three with my one, my two, my three. And then I put my, you know, after blowing the kids, put my hands on the lift bar bag and I'm like, what's Why happening? is this not going? Yeah. This, I'm not moving what's going on. And, something and years something. and years before, years before, when I have been training for my first world record, um, I had actually been using um, Pepin's sled way back then. And it had, in training, it would get sticky, um, like almost like the aluminum would, aluminum would would stick and you'd have to just kind of wiggle it. It was like the, mm. the connection between the, the lift bag part and the and the weighted part was like too tight. And so you'd have to kind of wiggle it. And there, there had been an occasion before where, you know, I had just kind of jiggered it and, and it had gone up. Um, and so I think the first thing I did was kind of wiggle the lift bag. And then you see me pull my fins out of the fin bin, like I'm gonna kick 90 pounds up to the, surface and I you know I try to I, I try to do that and I can hear um my safety diver John Garvin coming down behind me you know and I I can hear him talking to me and I know full well that he's getting the independent lift bag out um that he would attack would have attached to my harness um to you know to, to then send me out he has that Every dive, diver had one for them to encounter me, or he would have given given a signal, and they would have. Everybody would have had a like a. It was, it's a climbing a piece of climbing equipment that would have gripped to the line and pulled the line, the ballast, right. the every the carabiner or oh, something. Yeah, yeah, like I forget the name of it. Gregory it or something like that. And, Yeah, uh, it's for belaying, I think. So, um, you know, I I was well aware that things weren't going right. I was very with it at that point. I was well aware that they were doing everything that they were trained to do. Um, and when I finally relaxed and realized, okay, I'm going to have to let them get me out of here. I'm, I can't figure this out. Um, I had this singular thought that still makes every hair on my body stand up. Um, and I, I just want to preface it with, it wasn't, I'm going to die. It wasn't anything in relation to me not being safe or anybody getting hurt or certainly anybody dying. It was, I thought to myself, this is going to be sad. Um, and what I meant was I'm going to get back to the surface. Everybody's going to be disappointed. Um, everybody's going to be sad. You know, my mom is up there. Uh, my, my, my husband's up there. He's worked so hard. All these people that come out and support me, they're just going to be sad. Right. And it was like, this is going to be sad and a door slammed in my face and it was enough to wake me up and just like pull the pin mm. on the and so and then that was it and i dumped so much air in the lift bag by then that it started to race and then i got knocked out of my head and i think mm. it was by then yeah i spent an extra what i think two minutes of descent um 17 seconds at the bottom um stressed um i mean not you know not like freaking out stress but a bad start anxiety um and exposure to the nar narcosis or the nitrogen for the narcosis and that's when everything started to close in i just i relaxed so i was like okay i'm on my way back and i'm holding on to the lift bag and my vision started to go mm. my hearing you know tunnel vision losing my hearing and I knew what was happening I, I, because I'd experienced narcosis before on much shallower dives, inverted in colder water. Um, and so I knew what was happening. And so I gripped really hard with my hands so that I wouldn't let go of the lift bag. And I bit down on my tongue on purpose really, really hard because my wow. whole body was going numb. Everything was going numb. I was losing my hands. I was losing my legs. And so I bit down on my tongue really hard so that I would I was trying to stay awake um, so that I could feel something. Wow. And, um, you know, that worked for a while, but I think retrospectively, I think I, I mean, I don't think I blacked out, but if I say no, I didn't black out, but I don't have a recollection of about 200 feet of the ascent. Mm. Um, and that could be because it's all the same, or it could be because on some level, you know, I, my brain was not there enough to form memories, you know, whatever the, 
brain chemistry is. I don't think it's simple. You're awake or you're not. I think that's, it's a lot more complex than that. I think you were just focused on what do I do? Oh, I should probably bite my Possibly. tongue. Oh, it's I mean, weird. I feel narked. Like, you know, yeah, your brain I mean, was look, yeah. There, there's times where you drive home and you have no recollection of the last 10 miles because right. it's so habitual. So I don't, I don't, I, I do know that I did those things thinking to myself, I'm gonna pass out. And I, you know, the, it's just overwhelming, you know, that you're losing your hearing, you're losing your vision, your body's going numb, like e what's happening. <laughs> and so that was it. But then, um, you know, the next thing I remember, I, I think around 80 meters, I remember um, going past a diver again, or 80 or 50. Um, my husband was waiting for me around 25 and I remember whizzing past him. Now, the problem was normally you, you know, you're holding onto the sled and your arms are straight, right? Mm -hmm. um, because I was holding on so tight, I was, I was gripped. And so my arms were bent. And what that meant was the lanyard that ran behind me was slack. Mm -hmm. And so what I liked to do around 30 meters was reach back and pull the quick release and let go of the bag so that it could go up and i i believe in going through those last few atmospheres of pressure as slowly as possible and it's kind of on your body it, it was always also that moment for me and my husband we'd meet around 20 25 meters and you know i'd look at him and wink or nod and you know he uh, he would i'd give him an okay on something right. and it was just so you know so that we could share it before it was for everybody else and, um, and I, you know, it's kind of on your body. So the problem with me gripping so hard and bending my arms is there wasn't enough tension on the lanyard for the quick release to work. Mm. And so I couldn't, I was trying to figure out, you know, holding on the lip bag and trying to figure out the quick release before I then finally within probably 10 meters of the surface um, managed to release it and let go of the lift bag. I popped up like a cork. And, you know, you see on the film, uh, my husband's looking like this down and then going, whoop, as I just <laughs> whizzed by. But for his perspective, he couldn't see me because I put so much air in the lift bag at that point that there was just so much bubbles. He didn't know because then you see, I think on the video again, he looks down again. He's like, I, I don't know, I don't know. He kind of waits before he starts back to the surface. Um, so, you know, and then I, 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 I popped out. You're not out of breath after a dive like that um you i never could understand why other people would black out off to no limits i'll be honest with you i i don't there's there's to my mind the way that i dive there's no physiological reason to black out you're not hypoxic you've got a whole ton of oxygen in your system if anything my dives were slower than well I, you know i'm referring to the theme um you know, and I, I think I do know why I would like it, but, um, you know, there's no physiological reason. You are not hypoxic. You've been holding your breath for significantly less than you can hold your breath. You've actually had the benefit of partial pressure of oxygen. You, you felt great at depth. Um, in my case, really great at depth. And, uh, you know, that's it. So, you know, there's, you're not even puffing and panting. You're, you're completely fine from under the Ida rules. You have to wait one minute before you touch anybody or before your airway can go underwater because you're you're demonstrating complete control um and you know that nobody's holding you up and that you're not sinking because you're having a loss of motor control or 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 blacking out um and then that's it and then white card is given and you hug everybody and i told my husband i never want to do that again and um and that was that and then you uh, Myself, my husband, and the two judges watched the uh, camera from the bottom when the footage footage from the bottom when the cameras came up um, because Paul, you know, he was like, what's going on? I was like, it was, you know, it was just, you'll see, whatever. Um, and then we watched, <laughs> we watched the footage and he was like, what the hell? And I said, well, you know, well, and I didn't talk about it. I didn't talk about it for 10 years. I didn't talk about it until I stood on a TED stage and talked about it. Um, and that took a huge amount of coercion, but I realized that it was the platform where I, I again, needed to have this like brutal level of honesty with myself about it. And, and then within that same year, I agreed after saying no a number of times and a lot of coercion i agreed to the spn film um and uh you know then that was and that you know that's all 10 or so years ago um, and now you're here 
<laughs> so she did TED <laughs> Talk, <laughs> then ESPN, then Dive Talk. And she then keeps that, getting, that, you know what I'm saying? Really, she keeps really intelligent. Guys like <laughs> BBC is in dinner. Nothing what, else. Would you, if, <laughs> I'm going to ask you to try to say yes or no to this question. Just a yes or no. If, if you say I can't, I, I understand. If any of the safety protocols were not in place, like the divers weren't at the certain levels or anything else, on your judgment, would you have done the dive? Yes or no? Any no. of them. Okay. No. Do, are you mad at Pippin? Oh, I'm furious, of course. Okay. Um, so about you can so you can go off on Pippin on this. Channel, <laughs> by the way. This is okay. So right now, you and him are no good, what? not on good terms. Don't talk. Oh, we never. I mean, it, we go so we go so far back. It's ridiculous. But I mean, look. Here's what happened. Um, at that time, they were blogging their training, and you know, we were all following everybody's blogging and training and all that stuff. And they announced. I, was, I remember I was still in Turks and Caicos and, or maybe I wasn't, maybe I had left because we left two or three days after this. But anyway, it, it, clearly my mom had left or, or I'd come back and my mom was somewhere else um, because I spoke to my mom on the phone after reading it, uh, uh, what that their plans were. Now they're going to bring the record forward. Uh, they're going to take away training dives and they're going to make it go deeper. I didn't know about the the, the, the ridiculously uh, insufficient level of safety divers. I just knew, make her go deeper, give her less training dives. And I was extraordinarily upset about it. And I told my mom, he's going to kill her. He's going to kill her. Hmm. Um, and I, I had no idea that this was any kind of an epiphany or, wow. or anything, but it was just, I knew him and I knew enough about their relationship um, without, you know, going into that too much. Um, I knew enough about what it was to be on the other end of a man like that um, compared to somebody like my husband, you know. I had had enough experience in her shoes uh, combined with a simple passion for the ocean, um, but stuck in a relationship uh, that was abusive and hard Toxic. to get out of abusive. um yeah you know i've been there and so i was scared for her um i was hugely scared for her so would i yeah. if if we didn't have that safety no none nothing any any single piece of it any single piece of it wasn't there i wouldn't have dived nobody on that team least of all my husband would have let me dive so that yeah. was an easy question. So let me uh, let, let's let's talk about this because you mentioned something earlier, and and you said kind of an offhand comment like, unless you start your own free diving agency, then you can do what you want, <laughs> because that's exactly what this. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna try not to insult him in the in the show, like in this part of the show, because I already kind of messed that up. But um, this guy just went and created his own agency. Why? Like, why, if there's already an accepted international agency with safety standards, why go and make your own? Like, that makes no sense. Well, I mean, it's, he didn't like the rules. I mean, our rules are clear. You're not supposed to take a breath at any point on your descent, which is what he was well known to have been doing when he was diving. What? Um, and you're not supposed to black out and, and, and then say, eh, got the record. I'm alive now. Um, you're, and, and then, you know, you got to spend a shit ton of money on safety and you know we we had all those safety divers we'd flown them from co all corners of the earth um some of them didn't need paying some of them did i had incredible sponsors from at that point club med um to put all of these people up um i i had i chose a location with a hyperbaric chamber that was actually functioning and ready to take people we had rescue boats we i had a helicopter on standby we had all the safety stuff and then you know what we did we added more safety stuff which wasn't right. under the rules so if you don't like that or you need to rush it through or you don't want to make the money or you can't find divers quite frankly who are prepared to risk their life for you anymore to do safety uh then you make up your own organization that says you don't need any of that stuff and um you attempt to set world records and it's russian roulette and that's without attempting possibly to kill your wife so do you blame yourself in 
t- today, not when we watched the documentary and you did that interview, but now at all for anything that happened to her? Do you still feel some sense of guilt, if you will, or blame? Or Those anything? are two very different questions. Do I blame myself? No. I'm a grown okay. up. I'm 50 years old. My ego is not so big to think that that's what Good. caused her to die. Okay. How about do the second I, one? Do I, do I feel, okay, here's the deal. I, I said early on, whether we're recording or not, that I still find, I'm, I'm still trying to reconcile being a part of somebody else's journey that resulted so badly. And I mean, I, Audrey wasn't the only person that perished in the, in, in the quest for the No Limits world record. So this is a very hard part for me to swallow, that I am part of a story that resulted in other people losing their lives. Yes. Do I feel responsible? No. Um, but is it hard for me to live with? Yes, it is. The, 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 something that would go a long way selfishly to me feeling better about this would be if you're interviewing a different record holder, somebody who actually, you know, would succeed in, in going deeper. Um, and, you know, on paper, yes, the, the world record for the men is with Herbert. Uh, the world record for women is me. Unfortunately, you know, neither of those records are, are quote unquote clean from some kind of story because Audrey died. Um, Benjamin France had a terrible accident. Loïc Leferme lost his life all, all in the quest at that time to beat that number that I had put on paper as the world record. And then Loïc surpassed it and then was trying to push it further. Um, you know, and then uh, Herbert with his incredible dive, um, you know, he did not come away unscathed. And that really, I think, was the icing on the cake for, I think, I hope I'm not unfair saying this, no disrespect, but I think that that was the icing on the cake for Ida and sanctioning um, No Limits World Records. And I don't like that. I, I, I wish this was a happy story where people you know, carried on uh, competing successfully and safely and all the rest of it. Um, maybe Herbert proved that physiologically speaking, um, this is the, the limit for human beings. I don't know. Um, I don't so know. Tanya, let's, let's theorize here. Let's think about, you know, that incident and what happened to her. And let's talk about from the perspective of if she had a proper team like you did, and for some reason, the, you know, the tank malfunction, whatever, the bag didn't inflate. What could have happened with a proper safety team, number one? And let's talk about what could have been probably done differently with the team that she had. Like, because I always watching this, and I'm sure other people from Dive Talk to watch this thought the same thing, which is why didn't the diver just pass a regulator? Like, okay, the record's over, whatever. Here's here's some gas. Let's go. Let's start. Well, if anybody it. was legitimately thinking that they need to go back and do their patio open water one or whatever, because you can't, you you don't you don't do that. Even if okay. you can, I mean, you're under 250 pounds per square inch of pressure. If you could physically inhale, which I mm. so strongly suspect you couldn't, um, at any at any depth. I mean, any depth below 50 meters, you probably could up until about 50 meters or so. But after that, but then you then two things happen. First of all, you got to stay with that diver. Secondly, you're jeopardizing that diver's life because now you're breathing yes. the air that they need and they depend on. Uh, you are not equipped to be there. You're not dressed to be at that depth forever and ever. Like that, you know, I'm in a three mil wetsuit. They're in whatever they're in. I mean, actually, they were in shorts, but um, that's because they're <laughs> badass and it was very warm. But, you know, generally speaking, in other situations, you know, if you're at 500 feet, you're, you're you know, you're not in 76 degrees of water. So, um you know, you, it, it's not the right thing to do for anybody involved. It never escaped me on, on, on my dives that I was the only person in the water on those days that wasn't expected to risk my life to save somebody else. Wow. And that was huge. So the last thing I'm going to do is then intentionally jeopardize uh, somebody else. So uh, it, it was never going to be a thing. Everybody don't, don't offer her. She's not going to take it. It's not safe. You know, probably I get knocked out of my head as well. Like, I don't, I don't even know, but no is the answer. Um, did Pascal do the right thing? Yes, you don't offer somebody air. I mean, he went so far beyond. He did everything. He risked his life so much. And then he made the toughest decision ever, which was, you know, to, to risk having one body at the surface instead of two. If he had yeah. carried on, it could have been two. Uh, so, you know, 
to my mind, and I actually got a message on my my personal whatever messaging the other day um, in French uh, that he, that this person thought that Pascal should be in jail, and I responded in my school French that I did not believe so at all. No, um, no way. So uh, that that never changes. Um, I, I I think that. Yeah, yeah. I forgot the second part of the question. Uh, the, well, the, the this question may, was, what this may help you yeah, remember what, it. What could have been if it, if it were, I kind of phrased this to Gus before we started. If it were not for the fact that Pippin did not fill that ascent air tank, if it were not for that, in your mind, as a professional competing with her at the same time, do you believe she was fine otherwise and would have completed that dive? Yeah. Okay. Of course. I mean, I wouldn't have recognized it because it's not under the same governing body. Um, and I mean, and then there's also another factor here, which doesn't mean I wouldn't have recognized it, but she was dying. They, they would flood their sinuses, um, which then, to my mind, became, well, what? Why don't you just go really deep? <laughs> if you're not having to equalize, then then what? You wow, know? they will flood their sinuses. I didn't know that. Amazing. So, yeah. so you are so you are singularly pointing to the fact that because for whatever reason he either forgot or otherwise did not fill that ascent air, she died. I'm gonna go ahead and let those be your words. I, I don't need to be. I don't need to be sued for slander or any of that kind of like crap from Pippin. So, um, well, anybody can figure that out. If there okay. was air in the lift bag, she would have survived. Yes. Okay. Enough said. <laughs> I'm not getting into a pissing match with a bigger dick, frankly. <laughs> so. Yeah, I mean, I mean, you know. It, this is a matter of of opinion. So, you know, slander is a statement of facts that are not a statement of facts. This is a matter of opinion. So, you know, he could do whatever he wants, but that's, there's two different things. That's the definition of slander is not an opinion. Uh, if you, so honestly, that really kind of brings me to the, I, I'm, I'm going to try to word this carefully. <laughs> <laughs> do you how did he how did it end because i can't tell from the documentary they don't go into it why is, did nothing happen to pippin i mean nothing happened so he was on he's not on u.s soil he's the you know nobody else is speaking the language he's in a place where he's somewhat idolized and you then you've got people interviewing him or interrogating him that don't know anything about the sport you've got somebody who stayed underwater for eight minutes and lungs are full of water i mean it's a drowning a drowning is a drowning is a drowning um i i would like to think that if it had happened on u.s soil that it would have been investigated for more sure thoroughly um, and I think all of those things were very intentional on Pippin's behalf. Wow. So, okay. yeah, because, I mean, there's video evidence. Like, this is the, 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 I guess, investigation should be like, let's watch the video. Okay, we got all the facts. Like, it's not that hard. Everything is recorded. Well, well yeah, but that last part that you just said, I'm, I'm not going to be able to let that go. Because that's, mm -hmm. I know that you said that for a reason, and I'm really intuitive this way. What? All of those things <laughs> were intentionally done in your mind by him, which just raises the question, okay, uh, did he not fill that air tank knowing ahead of time he wasn't going to fill well, that I air think tank? The question, Is yeah, that I what think you're Carlos thinking by saying that? You know, uh, the, the Carlos, Sarah, I don't know, who, the, his team raised enough questions and know him way better. I mean, if you really want to get to the bottom of it, those are the people that you talk to. Yeah. Um, and, you know, they were there. They knew him. They knew the team dynamics. They worked with him before, blah, 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 blah. You know, uh, um, Nick and... I can't remember the 
that guy's name and I feel so horrible that that. But if they said on the film, you know, if they were there, then this wouldn't have happened to her. And I believe so, because those are two people that would have challenged Pepin. Um, and, uh, you know, if my husband was sitting here and he may walk in at any time, he would sit here and say, he would tell you that air tank it came into the room with us. It stayed in our hotel room. It then went with him. It then was topped up. It was checked. It was, it, it, there's a gauge reading it bef within minutes of me descending. There's a gauge showing that it's full. You need like 10% of that tank to do what it needed. It, it was full every time. Okay, so, you know, uh, did, did, was the tank empty? Of course it was, yes. Were they, uh, the, uh, yes, it was empty. We all know that. Was it negligent? It had a leak and nobody checked it? I guess that's what Pippin wants us all to believe. Well, uh, which, well, which then comes down to, well, that's ne your negligence. It's negligence. Negligence is negligence. You don't it's get It's still bad. For it. Yeah, well, but with Pippin, I mean, do you know of any other time that he didn't practice the same protocols that you just mentioned that the tank stays with him at all times? Oh, well, I all... mean, that's me and my husband. That's, I have no I idea know. what he did with his tank. What I know is that it was empty. I, I don't know. I, I know, I know, I know in this particular situation, you don't know what he did with it, but do you know how he normally operates in relation to the filling protocol of that tank? It's just a yes <laughs> or no. No idea. No? Okay. Do I know that all he's right. reckless? Yes. Do yeah. I know the details of his recklessness now? Okay. And I think what Tanya is saying is that it doesn't matter if he had it in his room or an assistant had it or a donkey carried it. Who cares? The point is, when he went in the water, he was in charge of making sure that thing was filled. Well, I'm he said asking. he was, and, and his other teammates say that, you know, don't touch it, don't touch it, don't touch it. So don't check it, don't touch it. Whether he's like, don't touch it, you might knock it and it might, you know, might empty. Fine. But then every, just do the one last step. Put a gauge on it. See if it has air in it. That's all you got to do. Yeah. Um, and if he's so adamant to not do that, then then why? And then when the result is what the result is, like, okay, then the question is raised. Um, was this intentional? Was it intentional to stage some heroic rescue? More than likely. Um, yeah. But, you know, you know. Okay. Uh, do you know now, this, this is really my final question, which is shocking, I know. Do you know, do you know if there is a now singular body regulating sort of free diving that is, is more singular now than it was back then? So like, Ada is... continues to, to ratify all the other disciplines except for No Limits and CMAS, uh, which is the, you know, the oldest governing body of, of, of free diving and scuba diving. Um, they regulate, uh, as far as I know, they do still sanction No Limits dives. And wow. who knows what Pippin's organization is doing. So under Ada, you'll be the record holder forever. They don't do it anymore. I guess. That's awesome. Uh, thank you so much. I mean, really, I really appreciate it. And I think that you're frankly amazing. And not just because you set the record, but because you're, you really, for me, it, I could, I can tell just how much you cared. It's I not did. that I you mean, feel I guilty, but the fact that you are struggling with the fact that you were some that you were involved as just because you're a competitor it's just that you're a good human being i i can tell it from just that i don't care about anything else right. and that 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 for me i really really respect you for that i i would be having the same struggle yeah thank you it is hard it's hard to reconcile it's not fun to be a part of a story where where anybody loses their life yeah. um and, you know, then for it to be this way, um, you know, all of my experiences with Pippin were at the very best disappointing. And then, you know, we went on to be on the same quote unquote team uh, because we were sponsored by the same dive manufacturer, um, dive equipment manufacturer. And I mean, the antics and the stupidity were just ridiculous and it was just stupid, it was stupid. It doesn't seem like there's a lot of people out there that like this guy. Well, uh, it doesn't matter. I mean, it doesn't matter to me. I, I, I don't, I don't care. Uh, I'm sure he doesn't care whether I like him or not. I mean, it's nothing. Um, I think, uh, um, I believe, you know, it's, 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 it doesn't go away and that's hard when you're a part of history that is negative and it doesn't go away. It's, I, there's a new Netflix film out, which I consulted on nothing beyond that, which is based on the, you know, the true story of Audrey and Pepin and, you know, that just came out this past week. 
and I'm sure that's why all of a sudden my inboxes oh. are pinging. Um, well, well, you know, I've been I've been reaching out for months, so I'm not an opportunist. <laughs> That's okay, cool. say thank you. You're a very patient <laughs> and determined man. I tried really hard to thank politely for, decline in did, many, awesome. many different ways. Awesome that you did. You know, ego is in, in every sport and it, it can make people absolutely believe and convince themselves of <laughs> truths that are not reality. And I'll just... Look, he, you're, I you're do very believe, kind. I believe um, he does not believe... In his in the reality of the situation, he's he doesn't in his brain register that because the ego is just way it blocking. It doesn't, doesn't sir. register. You know, yep. he's he's still trying to live a life and carve out a living, and I don't know and frankly yep. don't care Whatever. how that's Whatever. done as long as it doesn't impact me. Um, I hate all of it for Audrey. You know, there was a moment in time where we knew each other. And where I respected her as, an, uh, you know, a fellow athlete. Um, and I felt for her as a woman. And it was really heartbreaking. All of it is heartbreaking. Don't forget that, you know, somebody lost their daughter. People lost yeah. their friend. Um, and and it's, it's, it's really a really, really very tragic thing. And it didn't do good things for our sport and on a personal level i really don't appreciate that somebody who worked has worked hard to help i as best i can the image of the sport and you know the safety and the rules and the regulations it's real hard when some cowboy just comes in and you know screws it all up for everybody else so um and you know i should apologize not just for being playing hard to get for so long but, but also appearing cagey, like these interviews are hard for me to do. These, it, it, it's hard. Um, feels like it, you know, I thought if I make an ESPN film, people will stop asking me. Um, and yet here, here we are, it just sort of increases the fascination, but I don't regret any of it. I certainly don't regret being here uh, yet. Um, <laughs> <Thank you. laughs> well, we'll see what happens when this thing drops. <laughs> No, but oh, now right. you just hit the, the, the peak, right? We talked about ESPN, BBC, <laughs> Here I am. us. No, I so, yeah, just point them to oh, us. Oh, yeah, we're, so. yeah, we're, you know, definitely well, the peak. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. The peak of peak. what? Well, never mind. <laughs> um, but, yes, thank you so much for, for uh, speaking to us about this. And, uh, again, we – would have done a disservice to not have you uh, in this video to talk about this because we are complete idiots when it comes to free diving and all of that. One, you know, a few of us more than others. Um, and uh, anyway, we really appreciate you being here and uh, we can't wait to see all the awesome stuff that you're working on uh, with conserv conservation and, and all the projects. Well, thank you. Yeah, well, check out the film on Netflix. It's a plastic ocean. Still pretty awesome. Still very awesome. topical. Something that as divers and lovers of the ocean, we should really uh, keep spreading the word on, you know, keep keep mm -hmm. the, the wave of change towards the issue of plastics growing because it, the planet needs our help. Definitely. Awesome. Man, so glad that we were able to have her on the show to answer those questions because uh, we don't we're not at that level, right? She knows way more about this stuff. And she, and I'm just grateful that she was willing to answer the questions. Yes. It's not that she just came on the show, but I, I really, I did not hold tough, back because, because look, I mean, she is an expert. She was competing against and, you know, against Audrey. And I mean, it's important to hear her view on these particular specific facts because those are facts. Like the tank did not have air. For sure. It is a fact that the line was swaying. It is a fact that there was not a safety diver at the 130 meter point. It is a fact that there was not a doctor on the boat. It is a fact that on it, there's only two safety. On, I mean, and right? on, these and are on, facts. And on, and on. Yes. So how can we not, in our minds come to a conclusion that is pointing to one will you say i mean I, per, 
I would have loved to be in. Uh, 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 who, on ca that. who caused the death is what yeah. I'm, I'm ultimately thinking. And and what you learn during the documentary is that they questioned this guy, Pipin, for two hours and then they let him go. Yeah, no problem. Sorry. It was an accident. We feel bad for you. Have a good trip back home. Look right? at her before the dive. Black and blue eye. Withdrawn. Just, man, this is a bad situation. Right. And right. apparently Tanya knew of their relationship. Like you're going to hear, you heard in the interview. I'm just saying, guys. Not to uh, <sighs> quote my, our friend Medi, but Medi has this phrase that I think this is the most appropriate person to ever use that phrase. But he, this guy has a very punchable face. Keep in. <laughs> That's what Betty says. I love when he says that um, because I've never met anyone that has a more punchable face than this guy. And I would have loved to be in a fly on the wall during those two hours to see how this guy got out of it. Because if this had happened in the U.S., like there would have been an investigation of some, and, and, a, and a short one because everything is on video. I mean, it looks so staged. Give me my scuba gear. Give me my scuba gear. Swimming down like that. And it, listen. I got this. I got this. I'm the guy. I'm, you know, you, you heard me in the interview. I mean, ego is so frigging dangerous when it comes to the things we do in the water. And it can create a sense of reality in your brain that is so far from reality. And, you know, this, this one's difficult, dude. This was, this was a, this was, this was not the easiest one we've ever reacted to. And, it just pisses me off, frankly. Yeah. Very, very dangerous sport. And we have covered other dangerous activities related to freediving, like the guy who created 14 rules for freediving in caves. Remember when we yes when we review those rules? Yeah. And I'm going to leave that video right here. So you guys can check it out and see if you uh, like those rules or what. Yeah. Thanks, everybody. Bye. See you next time.